Hello again gamers, welcome back to the Board Game Captain. I'm the Board Game Captain. I'm Lynn. And today we're going to be talking about and reviewing and showing you how to play Tyler Sigmund's Crows. Now this here we have is the Collector's Edition. It's actually numbered. This is number 665 of 1,500 copies of the Collector's Edition. We take it off and you see the more normal cover that we have here. So Tyler Sigmund's Crows is... Uh, Obviously designed by Tyler Sigmund, but with some additional gameplay by David Gerard and artwork by Justin Hillgrove. It was also published by Junk Spirit Games. And I want to show you all of that there. Uh, Tyler Sigmund's Crows is listed as for two to four players, ages 30 to 45 minutes. Eight, uh, excuse me. It's, <laughs> it lasts 30 to 45 minutes and is for ages 10 and up. That's right. You're only allowed to play this when you're half an hour to 45 minutes old. <laughs> I'm leaving that in. So, <laughs> then, so this game is kind of an, a weird sort of like abstract tiling. Ti yeah, tiling game. And it's 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 very take, okay. There's there's, there's sort of a take that with the cards. A little, little bit. bit, but it's not really. I mean, it's really just sort of like stealing points from yeah. your opponent with the with the card the spell cards. But it's really um it's a little hard to describe because while it is a tiling game, and that is for sure, and while it has some very abstract game elements. This game plays very interestingly. It has a very different sort of play style than just about anything else in our collection. I can't think... Can you think of any other game that that we have played that you could even say is, oh, that's like Crows? I mean, I can't think of a no, single one. I, I think because we, we have lots of tile laying games, but you usually, like... You put that on the tile, and that's it. You don't then move stuff around yeah, on the tiles. Yeah, this you put pieces on the tiles, and the tiles are, are, are spaces in a board that you then move... Yeah, you move them around. Mm -hmm. So, uh, now, for the two to four players, I want to draw attention to this, because we've played this at a lot of different... Uh, I think every player count, and it's equally good. It scales really well at every player count. I like it at two players, I like it at three players, I like it at four players. Um... Yeah, I don't. I can't think of a specific player count that that's overtly the best or overtly the worst. What do you think? Yeah, I think it's it's enjoyable <clears throat> at all of the different player counts. Do you have a favorite or a least favorite, or is, is it really? really? It, yeah, yeah, I was gonna say it's pretty equal. The thirty to forty five minutes is probably a good estimate. It's actually a kind of like a midway in regard to time length. This is not, it's not like a, a 15 to 20 minute game. It's not real quick, but it's also not really long. It actually, most games do really fall into mm -hmm. that under an hour mark. And for the ages 10 and up, I would say that's a pretty good estimate. Yeah. So actually, I mean, it's rare that I thoroughly agree with everything the company puts <laughs> in that little box for players, time and age, but holy crap, I agree with everything they put in the box. So, yeah, not much more to talk about there. And you agree with all of it, too? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, wow. That's kind of weird, actually. That stands out as, <laughs> as an odd thing that we agree with all of it 100%. So here's the rule book. Now, I want to draw attention to the rule book. I like it very much. It, uh, it's very well done. It gets you up and playing no t in no time. It's got lots of diagrams to help illustrate the points. It's full color. Um, yeah, this is a really well done rule book. I've, I've got a few gripes with some of the other things. I'll get to those in a moment, but no, no gripes with the rule book. It really helped me to understand, especially some of the more complex concepts like how to deal with a murder when a murder of crows happens. Uh, there's a diagram there that shows how to, to spread the crows from a murder. Now, this is the collector's edition. I'm not sure if they have this in the regular edition, but in, so. in the collector's edition, there's a bunch of extras and... I want to throw this out there. If you can buy a copy of the collector's edition, do because oh my god, is there tons of extra content? You've got, you've got what one, two, three, four extra modes of play, which is mm -hmm. kind of crazy, kind of awesome. And one of them is a solo mode, <clears throat> which is kind of like a puzzle. So that's that's pretty cool. Uh, we haven't tried all of the extras yet. Full disclosure: we've been mainly playing the game by its standard rules, so we could review it by its standard rules. But I actually am quite excited to try a lot of these extras. I want to start adding them in. Specifically, the familiars and the king and the trickster look really interesting to me. Uh, it came with a felt bag. I think again, this is like an extra. I'm not even sure what to put in the felt bag. Maybe the crows. Maybe you can put the crows in the felt bag. Um, you've got now the artwork. Um, which is by Justin Hillgrove. So Justin Hillgrove does all the artwork over at Junk Spirit Games, and wow, is he awesome. Um, his artwork is fantastic. I love, they've got these cards that you basically just put your coins on them, 
and they really just match the color of what your player is but each one has two possibilities for the mage that you are and the artwork is awesome the artwork in this game is just fantastic it's delightfully quirky i love that i love these cards i love the two options for the mage you're gonna be they're very different from each other each and they're just i mean they're just great you've got um in addition to those you've got these nice chunky wooden crow meeples which they have like half a dozen different poses i mean you've got some that are just like oh look i'm a crow and i'm standing but then you have this one who's like i'm a crow and i'm looking backwards over my shoulder and then you've got there's a crow that's like flapping his wings let me see if i can find one of one of them you've got this one squawking there's a crow cawing i guess cawing would be the mm -hmm. better word not squawking oh there's one of the ones and here's a crow actually getting ready to take off and fly i mean there's a bunch of different types of crows the crow meeples are great uh in this case we've got the extra crows for the extra modes uh they come with i'm not sure what these are made out of um they're wood but they have these nice nice obelisks that are the color of your player uh we have an extra one that's red that's for one of the extra modes of play but these are really nice they're these the pieces in this game are chunky and i mean I you hear them it's all wood because on the back of the box it says wooden crow meeples so i think you think these are wood yeah. too they so the 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 production is very quality in this. That is one thing I really want to draw attention to. Now, for the collector's edition, instead of cardboard punch-out coins, we have these nice metal coins, which, oh my god, I love metal coins. I love games that give me metal coins. This is another reason that if you can get the collector's edition of this one and you're interested in it after watching our video, do get it. Because these metal coins, and they have them in three different denominations, are amazing. They're really cool. And it also comes with a metal first player marker, some punch out tokens for various things. These are what the punch out coins look like, by the way, in case you want to get the regular edition, because they also come in the collector's edition. Uh, and then we've got some spell cards. Uh, is this the whole spell deck here? So the spell cards have this crow with like a flare on it on the back, and then they have the name of the spell on the front. Now this is one of my few gripes on the production uh, design for this game. I, I think everything looks beautiful. I love the artwork. The production overall is top notch. This is one of very few gripes that I have, and I'll talk a little bit more about it in the end. But my gripe here is that it doesn't actually tell you on the card what the spell does. Mm -hmm. You have to look on the cheat sheet or look in the rule book to see that. It's very, actually very minor compared to, to the totality of the circumstances. And then we have the tiles, and uh, the tiles again, nice artwork. You can see this is this is a baron's tile this is a tile with a picture of a crow on a on a branch and we've got this one here is a ley line nexus point the artwork on these are really nice and on the backs of the tiles you have a pair of crows uh one upside down from the other each clutching onto a ruby or probably mana stone considering mm -hmm. the the theme of this game so that's about everything that comes in the box for tyler sigmund's crows uh let's head over to the table we'll show you how you play this game and then we're going to come back and we're going to talk about how this game feels uh, we're going to rate it and review it. Okay, so here you can see us set up for a three-player game of Tyler Sigmund's Crows. So now I am controlling a player on this side of the table here uh, with the purple totem, and I am being uh, Bruinor the Doomsayer. Not Doomslayer, but Doomsayer. And then on this side of the table, I'm also controlling the yellow player, who is Jocelyn Wog, the, fors uh, the Forsaken Past, and is the yellow player. And then who do you have over there? I'm the blue player, and I have Dre Kilwick, the Undiplomatic. Yes, these cards are just for flavor, but they're fun. And each one has two options of who you can be. They actually have, they're two-sided, so they have two different types of characters. So then, uh, in order to set up the game, each player chooses a color. They take their card, they take their mana totem, uh, which is that little obelisk. Then we shuffle all the spell cards and we place them face down into a deck near the board. Would you win, win point to, to the spell cards? To the spell cards, thank you. <laughs> uh, then we set aside the Nightfall tile, which is like an endgame tile. We shuffle up all of the tiles into a stack. And then what we do is, depending on how many people are playing, you take out a number of tiles. If you're playing a two-player game, you remove eight tiles from the game. If you're playing a three-player game, you remove four. If you're playing four players, you actually use all the tiles. 
After shuffling up the stack, you take the top six tiles off, shuffle them up with the nightfall tile, and put those seven tiles on the bottom of the tile stack. So the end of game is triggered somewhere within the last seven tiles, but you don't really know where. Then you draw the top 13 tiles from the board and place them out as shown here in this exact pattern. And tiles that should get a crow, you put crows on them. Then you, uh, each player draws two tiles and keeps them hidden as their hand. For instance, here are my two tiles that I'm keeping hidden. And then you figure out who's going to be the first player. We've decided that yellow will go first and you give them the first player marker, which in this case is this nice uh, black metal coin because we have the collector's edition here. So then you're ready to play. So we're going to start the first turn. So for the first round, uh, we start by each of us taking a turn. So we're, we're going to start again with the yellow player who, to take their turn, they're going to look at their hand and they're going to choose to play one of the tiles from their hand. Now the tile can has to be played uh, with one of its sides touching at least one of the other tiles that's already in the board. They can't be played only diagonally touching like the ones that were set up. So they're going to play a gem cave right here in the middle of all these other tiles. And then after playing a tile, they're going to place their mana totem on one of the tiles on the board. Now they could place it anywhere, but specifically they want to place it on this gem cave. And the reason is the gem cave acts as a tiebreaker. So if anyone else winds up equidistant from these crows that are all right next to it later when they flock, the gem cave will be a tiebreaker and they'll get the crows. They are ensuring to get lots and lots of crows. Now, the gem cave doesn't have any effects when it initially comes up. Lots of the other tiles do, like tiles that show crows on them. You have to put that many crows on them. And the carrion tile automatically gets one crow on it when it comes up and then gets one crow on it at the end of each round. Uh, some others have effects, which we'll tell you about as we play. But in the case of this, the gem, gem cave's one effect is that it is a tiebreaker. And also, if the queen crow ever comes up, she is attracted to the gem cave. So that is going to be it for uh, the yellow player's turn. They're going to then draw a tile to replace the tile that they they played. And it is now Lynn's turn. Lynn, what are you going to do? I'm going to place uh, that there. That is the, what do they call the that space? The ley line, line nexus. Ley line nexus. Okay, so now that's a double pointer. So any points you get there are going to earn you two points for everything you put there. So that is always really good. So let's see. What shall I do now? Hmm. Okay, so I'm going to play this tile here, which, because it has a picture of a crow on it, immediately gets me a crow. And now one of the rules on playing, one, uh, playing your mana obelisk here is that you cannot put it on a tile that already has crows on it. So in, because of this, I am going to be the only person for the entire first round who's actually going to play on a tile that I did not place this round. So I'm going to be placing here on the barons. And this is a really good tile for me because not only is it going to get me a few crows, but after I draw the tile to replace the one I played, playing on the barons also lets me draw a spell, which has an extra effect I'm going to keep in my hand and I could use later, or it can be worth two points at the end of the game if I don't use it. So, now that we have all played, the next thing we do is we flock the crows. So, Lynn, why don't you flock the ones over by you, because they're, they're the easiest to show. Crows will flock over, as long as there's no interruptions, they will flock in straight lines only, no diagonals, so vertically or, or horizontally, towards the closest mana obelisk. So if there is a tie, gem, gem caves count as tiebreakers. So over here, you can see that these are adjacent, one space away from this mana obelisk. There is no, con uh, no difficulty in figuring that out there. These two are adjacent here as well. And they are two spaces away from me, but only one space from the yellow obelisk there. And this one also will flock in to the yellow obelisk. Now the purple obelisk gets this and this. Now these are not, these two crows are not horizontally or 
vertically in a straight line uninterrupted from any obelisk, so they will stay exactly where they are. Then each of us, one at a time, starting with the first player, gets points equal to the number of crows that flocked to our location. So yellow went first, and they got six crows. So that's huge. That gives them six points. So this coin is a fiver, and this is a oneer. So that is six points. They're going to put it on their cart. So Lynn, how many uh, did you well, get? Well, I got double points, so I got eight. So Lynn will take eight points. And then I got three. So I'm going to take three points and put it on my card there. Now, we check to see if there is a murder of crows. Now, there is a murder because a murder happens if at least six crows had flocked to the same space. And in this case, it's this space here that yellow got. So two of the crows will fly off as a mated pair. We remove them for the board. And then they get to pick a direction and cycle out in a spiral and drop one crow off on each space as they go. So they're going to choose to go... This way first, they're going to go one, two, three, and four. And then at the end of the round, if there are a carrying space, the carrying space will get an additional uh, crow on it. And then we all will remove our tokens from the board. We pass, oh well, yes, we put a mana corruption token on the space that had the murder. Uh, because that means no one can play their obelisk on there until another murder happens. Because when another murder happens, we will remove all previously placed mana corruption tokens. Now, the first player token is passed on, and then Lynn will start us off on the second round. Oh, another Barons, huh? Oh, okay. I see what you're doing. All right, so you play there, you get your replacement, and you get to get a spell card. Very nice. I'm going to play this one here, which immediately gets two crows on it. And then I'm going to place my obelisk here. And I'm going to play my spell, which is a teleport, which allows me to take up to two crows from a single space and move them onto an empty space somewhere. And I'm going to take two crows from here and move them there. And then I discard my spell card, and I also uh, rep replace the tile that I played by drawing another tile. Then it is the yellow player's turn. The yellow player is going to play a Baron's here, and play on the Baron's right there, and that lets them draw a tile and a spell card. So, then we now are going to flock the crows again now that everybody has played so uh, let's see how this goes so these crows are tie broke for purple because they're two spaces away from blue but only one space from purple so they are going to go to purple these crows here are going to go to purple because they are the only that is the only direct line they can draw as well as these two here uh, this crow is tie broke for yellow from blue because it is one space from yellow but uh, three from blue and this one and this one are going to go here as well to give three for yellow. But this one is tie broke to blue. And those two go directly to blue as well. So now once all the flocking happens as it just did again, we are now going to uh, check points and then check for murders. So blue and yellow each get three points. Whereas purple made out like a bandit this round with, wow, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight points, which is huge. So they're going to, they were in, in last place, but they're going to shoot right ahead and possibly be tied for first now, doing quite well. So then, now purple is the only one who got a murder. So we're going to remove the previous mana corruption from the board. We're going to have two of them, the crows from that space, fly off in a mated pair again. Again, purple is going to pick a direction and start placing them out. They're going to pick in this direction here. So they're going to go one, two. They skip the empty spaces. One here. Then as they get here, it's one here. Then out here, skipping the empty spaces all the way back around to here. And then we put a mana corruption token on the space where that murder was and we remove our obelisks from the board again. And this is how you play a game of Murder of Crows. You slowly build out this giant interworked uh, system of tiles. Now, some of the things you didn't get to see are the lava pools, which there is one out there. When crows are flocking across a lava pool, like for instance, let's say this lava pool was here, 
and someone had placed their mana totem here while there were quite a few crows over here, the crows would flock but then stop at the mana pool. And they wouldn't, excuse me, the lava pool. And they wouldn't fly across it. Now, on the other hand, if we started with the crows on the lava pool and then played a totem down, they would flop off of the lava pool as normal. Another thing we didn't get to show, I don't know if anyone has it in their hands, was the queen's totem. Did you? I, I, my last draw, I got it. So when the queen's totem comes out, that makes the queen crow come out. Now, the queen crow is worth three points. And so that's very valuable. She flocks as normal. However, if there is the ability to flock to a mana stone on a gem cave, for instance, let's say uh, she had flocked to there and I had a mana stone here, but yellow had a mana stone there as an example, she always gives preference to the stone on the gem cave, even if it's further away. So in this case, the queen crow would not flock to the yellow totem. It would flock to the purple totem. And that's basically it. I believe that would, that kind of covers all of the different uh, tiles, if not all of the spells. There's six different spells. Uh, another spell I had drawn in over here was Landfall, for instance, which lets you play it to draw an extra tile and immediately play it onto the board, which is really cool. There's also spells that allow you to disperse crows and spells that allow you to flock crows to alter the, you know, possibly make it so certain crows won't flock to your opponent and instead flock to you. But that's how you play it. You play this game until the, that final tile sh shows up. And when it shows up, you, you replace it immediately, finish out the full round. And once the round is finished, you count up who's got the most points and they're the winner of Tyler Sigmund's Crows. So now we're gonna head back over to the table and we're gonna talk about how this game plays and how it feels. And we're gonna review it and rate it. Okay, welcome back. So that was how you play a game of Tyler Sigmund's Crows. I really feel like saying the whole title of this game with Tyler Sigmund in it because well, when you just say crows, it doesn't sound as interesting. I think, I, I you, think that is the entire title. I mean, it is the entire game, title. I mean, you, you could call it crows for sure, but that sounds way less interesting. I like the whole yeah. Tyler Sigmund's Crows. I mean, okay. And a big part of why I like saying Tyler Sigmund's Crows is I think he did a really good job on the design of this game. I mean, he was really thinking outside the box with this one. The... the the obelisks feel like magnets to me, while the crows are pieces of iron strewn about in the way the mechanics work, you know? And you're trying to have your magnet be closer to the iron to attract the pieces to you. Now, I know I just basically, like, put a different theme on this, but it just I'm just talking about the mechanics. And it's really interesting, because I don't... And we talked about this a little bit in the intro... I have not played another game that plays like this. It's really kind of unique. It's really kind of interesting. If you guys know another game that plays like this, please tell me. But, um, yeah, so we showed you a little bit of how the game played. But, basically, the board slowly grows out. You fill in the gaps and you expand and you wind up with this big, epic, cool tile-laying board. But, unlike another game for tile-laying, like, say, you know... Uh, uh, lanterns, for instance, mm -hmm. where you just wind up with a bunch of cool tiles and you're like, oh, look how pretty the pattern of the tiles is. You're also putting your, your piece on it, moving oh, the crows just, around on it. I just it. thought of another game where you place tiles and you put things on it. What? Uh, Takonoku. Okay, I could see that. Yeah, all right. Yeah. So, but but even then, it, it doesn't play like Takanoko, no. the way you attract the pieces around. But that's about no, the closest I mean, comparison I, you yeah, can make. Yeah, I mean, the bamboo just grows on it and the panda moves around. Yeah, but yeah, but so, okay. So, and, and even then, that's not a very close comparison. Yeah. So it's tough. This is a pretty unique concept. And I love, I love the unique concept. Also, and I did talk a, a little bit about this in um, the beginning. The collector's edition is amazing. I love... Well, the art on everything, whether it's regular or collector's edition, is gorgeous and absolutely beautiful. I love the theme. But the collector's edition, if you can get the metal coins and all the extras, yeah, yeah, it's worth it. Get the collector's edition. It's amazing. But before I, I gush about this too much, because I'm obviously, <laughs> obviously giving a positive review to this game, maybe we should stop for a moment, take a breath, and talk about any negatives we have. So what do you have? Uh, do you have any negatives to say about Tyler Sigmund's um... Curse? Not really. It, my only negative is that I can never remember what the spell cards do. Yes, you had said during one of the times we were playing that you really wish... So there's a cheat sheet in the back of the rule book, and you can pass that around. But you had really wished they had included some cheat sheet cards. Because um, you don't... The spells aren't really integral. Like... Yeah. 
You can have a turn without playing them. I mean, you can play an entire game without the spell cards if oh, yeah. you just never... You collect them for points because yeah. they're worth two points at the end of each. Um, so it's not like you're using them all the time and you just remember from repetition right. what they do. So, and that oh, that's also a gripe that I talked about a little bit in the beginning that's a little interlinked is that I kind of wish they had had written on the spell cards what the spell card does. Uh, and then you wouldn't even be needed a, a, a little cheat sheet. So that is a little two-sided gripe there uh, that you would have liked personal cheat sheets and I would have liked the spells to have written on them and you also would have liked the spells to have written on them what they do. But that being said, <clears throat> for the overall game, that's kind of a minor gripe. Yeah. Um, I don't really have any other gripes for this game, do you? No. So the game plays really well at all player counts. It plays really fun. It's really unique. The production is top-notch. The artwork is gorgeous. What's something positive you want to talk about about this game? Um, I like how it's almost like a puzzle. Mm. And you're trying to fit the puzzle pieces to um, benefit yourself. Yes. While other people are also trying to fit their puzzle pieces to benefit themselves. Mm. And, then, and it's kind of, it's, it is, it's kind of like a puzzle that, the same, like, people are doing the same puzzle at the same yes. time, and it's it's really hard to explain. No, but no, but we showed it. We showed it. And yeah. you know what? And it's very interesting because, okay, so the person who goes last in order, I think, has the most advantage because they can often, not always, but often play uh, spells and, and tiles in a way to take crows away from their opponents. It does happen a lot. Mm -hmm. But the first player marker constantly turns around the table so everybody gets a chance to be first and everybody gets a chance to be last. And sometimes being first, you can play the right tiles and right cards to even make being first an advantage. Because uh, if you throw down and you're one space away from a bunch of crows on a gem cave, hello, no one's going to best you on that unless mm -hmm. they've got you know spells that, that force crows to move away from that gem cave, like the teleport. Or there's another one that forces them to, to flock, but not flock normally they just flock in a straight line towards where you want them to go so <clears throat> puzzle is a good word for it though it is very puzzly it is very thinking like when we play this game there's a lot of this <laughs> okay, okay. you think only having two tiles in your hand to choose from it would be easier well no but it's all the different places you're thinking yeah. no but i think it's delightful this is a uh, one that especially as the game goes further on and the and the board starts to grow outward it gets brain burning as you start to, and, and that's a good thing. Like you, it gets really engaging. You get, you get so hooked into it. You find yourself just engrossed in the decision of, do I play this tile or that tile? And then where do I put the tile? Mm -hmm. And then am I playing my, my totem on the tile I just placed? Or am I going to play it over here? Because where's going to get me the most crows? Is, is it better to have more crows or is it better to have a few less, but steal some from my opponent who's winning? And those are the decisions you're making when making this game. This game is delightful. Um, do you want to rate it first or shall I? Um, I don't know. Well, this was your buy. Oh, you bought okay. this one. Maybe you, do you want to go first or second? What do you okay, think? I'll go first. Okay. Um, I think I'm going to give it an eight. You read my mind. I'm, oh, okay. I'm, right, I'm right there with you. <laughs> so, I mean, okay. You you bought this game. Your, you, this was your decision. Mm -hmm. And the first time we played it, I was like, Oh my God! Lynn bought a game that I think like may have made it onto my hot top hundred games of all time. This is this game is fantastic. I really enjoyed this game. So, like, what what goes into your decision to give it an eight uh, from your opinion? Um, for me, it's the my ability to remember how to play between games. Is it is that just because of how much you like the game that it just really sticks I with think you? It's you just, well, I it, I think it's just. There's not a lot going on. Like, you, so, you play a tile, okay. you, you place your obelisk. So is it I mean, just that it's very approachable? Yeah, there's, I mean, there's, uh, you know, a bunch of different tiles, but you can easily look up what they do. And for me, it's, it's very much the artwork and the theme I really enjoy. And also, the mechanics are so damned engrossing that I just, I really, I get, when I'm in the middle of playing this game, I'm in love with this game. I'm, like, really loving it. Um... Now, it's not my favorite game of all time, but any game that's about an eight or up, I gush about because those those are where it's to the point where I'm like, I love this game. So, yes. So, eight stars from me. Eight stars from Lynn. That is 16 total stars from us here at the Board Game Captain. That is two thumbs way up. Way up for Tyler Sigmund's Crows. 
Um, I think we can both highly recommend it to you if you think anything we talked about sound in sounded interesting to you. So, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns either on this video or on the game of Tyler Sigmund's Crows, feel free to put them in the comments down below. And if you enjoyed this review and tutorial video and you'd like to see us do more like it in the future, be sure to give it a like, share it on all forms of social media, and if you haven't already, please subscribe to the Board Game Captain. That's Captain spelled with a K on YouTube. And hit that little bell icon on my channel so you get updates every time I upload a new video. And until next time, game, game on. on.